Hello, everyone, and welcome to this IANA webinar, a close look at IANA's intermodal market trends and statistics, the 2018 mid-year update. I'm Hal Pollard, the Director of Education at IANA, and I'm pleased to introduce today's panel. Pat Casey, the Vice President of Fleet at TTX Company, John Woodcock, the Director of Market Development at TTX Company, and Peter Wolf, the Director of Market Development at TTX Company. Now, a little bit about what to expect in this webinar. First, we'll cover the current economic conditions and take a look at the first half of 2018. Then, we'll have a year-to-date IANA's number review, look at the international and domestic intermodal market and how it's performing, and then open it up for questions. So now, without any further ado, let's get started. Gentlemen? I'll start with a brief economic review. Um, as you see, there has been a significant accelerating growth in the second quarter of 2018, fastest we've seen in four years. Uh, the, the tax cuts have, have been a big part of that. Uh, growth is expected to continue, but things are likely to tighten over time. We see a lot of tightness in the employment industry, manufacturing components uh, in our freight industry. Things are very tight. We know that as well. Fiscal debt is rising. Uh, interest rates are rising. All those things suggest that uh, we're, we're going to have strong growth for a while, but it, it should slow down a little bit. And you can see that uh, the prediction, we get this from Moody's Analytics, that investment will be uh, very strong through most of uh, 2019. Consumer spending, uh, we expect to continue growing, but not quite as quickly as it has recently when you got that big boost in income for consumers to, to drive that up. So we'll see how far that goes, how strong it is, and when things change. The vast majority of economists have predicted uh, that there will be a recession sometime in the next two to three years. Now, not a, a terrible one like we saw uh, 10 years ago, but uh, the expectation is that difficult to forecast for sure, uh, but something that is expected. Now, uh, industrial production is very strong, um, and we like this ISM index because it also it tells you what's being produced, but also what the future is. And you can see that uh, new orders, uh, export orders, backlog orders are all uh, well above 50, which suggests there is some strong industrial production in the future as well. And that is a big driver of freight. And so that's something that's, uh, that's very, very important. Uh, we expect that to continue. One other thing I'd mention is a lot of uh, both the investment and the production that we've seen recently is because of high fuel prices and uh, getting more and more production of, of oil in the United States recently. Employment gains have been very, very solid over time, and the unemployment rate is at the lowest rate it's been this century. Labor force participation isn't rising, and that's one of the big tightening issues that the economists see is that employment is getting very, very tight. Can you continue to grow fast? We just can't add more employees to things. And, and we see that some in our industry too, that, Trucking companies, the railroad, they are all working very hard. Many are paying publicly announced high level bonuses to employ more people. And that tells you a lot about the tightness of employment. Uh, the other thing we look at as an indicator of the recession is this yield curve, which is flattening out. Hopefully you've all heard about that before. If that is completely flat or especially inverse, that is the number one predictor of a recession. Uh, always tells you about that. And uh, so we'll see where that goes. But the Federal Reserve is raising short term interest rates. Uh, long term rates have fallen recently, too. And that may flatten out and, and lead to a recession. So we do see strong short term growth, but longer term, there's going to be some risk. And the final one shows you what our original forecast was and how we've updated it based on changes that we've seen to uh, policies early this year. Uh, so another more than half percent increase in GDP, uh, a little bit of a change overall this year in consumer spending, but big change in retail sales and in investment so far. Housing starts have been better than we thought, but not growing terribly quickly. Uh, lower vehicle production in the U.S. right now, the sales are a little bit stronger. Um, and industrial production, uh, some of the biggest increase that we've seen so far. Now, we haven't changed uh, significantly our outlook. For Mexico or Canada yet. We'll see where NAFTA goes. I mean, that's certainly an important part of the North American intermodal business, and that's what we're talking about.
talking about here is in North America. Uh, we'll see where they go, but they're doing well so far. So that covers that. We look forward to any questions you might have about the economic outlook as we move forward. All right, I'll talk a little about the, the numbers for a few minutes. Kind of reminds me, I think there's a radio station in New York. I might be getting it wrong. But I think it's station 1010. And they say, you give us 60 seconds, we'll give you the world. So okay. bear with us about two minutes, <laughs> and we'll run through uh, some IANA numbers. We pull all this from the ETSO database, which stands for Equipment, Type, Size, and Ownership. It seems aptly named. So why don't we run through the numbers for a few minutes here. And I, the theme for the, the number section is it's it's been a very good year. The first half uh, was quite strong. And no matter what segment you're looking at, whether it's international, remodel, domestic, or by region, U.S., Canada, Mexico, solid growth no matter where you look. And then just drilling down a little bit further into the ETSO database, we can see the growth number uh, by volume. Uh, again, I don't want to spoil anything that John's going to say, but when you see the trailer numbers, you see that they've uh, grown about 16%. And John will talk more about the, some reasons for that when he gets a chance to talk if I uh, relinquish the microphone. But for domestic containers, international containers, growing around 6%, it's growing roughly twice GDP, something in that range. It's a pretty normal growth rate. Nothing unusual except to say that everywhere is growing pretty well and it's been a good half a year. And then if you break that down a little bit further, which you can do in the database, you can look at it by region. Again, all the regions did pretty well, with the exception of maybe uh, the Northwest. But again, if you look at the monthly data, which is also available, you can see the last few months the Northwest has uh, seemed to have turned a corner, and there's some pretty uh, solid growth coming out of coming out of that. And one other point in the Northeast, growth has been about 12%, and John's going to talk a little about that as well in terms of what's driving growth. But when you think about the growth drivers, whether it be competition with truck and higher fuel costs, driver issues, ELDs, that affects international intermodal as much as it does domestic freight, the domestic volumes. And in the Northeast, we're seeing that there's some pretty strong international volumes. Uh, it's not just a, a domestic story when you're thinking about uh, uh, the growth this year. The next slide, so we have uh, the next two slides, we'll have the top growth lanes and then the, the bottom lane. But again, the, the story is similar that the growth is spread out across a bunch of regions. It isn't just concentrated in one region. Um, so it, it's all, all pretty good. And growth is in some big lanes. It's in some small lanes. Um, and I think that the next slide, just to kind of going through it quickly, is it, you may recall if you listened on the, the last webinar that we had a number of, of dog markets where a whole bunch of markets were in the red. And uh, it was hard to find uh, one that was in the red. Southwest to Southeast is, is fairly negative. So only one market that kind of stinky or one segment. And even then, like I say, the last couple of months, we've seen a turnaround in the Northwest uh, region. So again, sticking with the theme, it's pretty good in all the markets. So now we can dive in more specifically in one market, which is international and intermodal. And for people who are new on the call, international intermodal refers to the marine containers, the 20-foot, the 40, and the 45-foot containers that move inland by rail. This is sometimes called IPI for inland port intact. Sometimes it is referred to as intact shipments for short, or sometimes it's called ISO shipments or International Organization for Standards. So it has lots of names but they all mean the same thing. It's that marine container routing inland by rail. And we've showed this slide, uh, I think, at all of the, the webinars, and it sort of sets the stage and to help understand what is going on in international intermodal. TTX will watch three things. First, the import, how much is coming in. That's a big driver of international intermodal is how many imports are coming in in the first place. Then where do the imports land, east coast versus west coast? And then how do the imports route inland? Do they go IPI or do they transload? And we'll have a slide on each of these in just a moment. And so first, let's talk about the imports. And again, to understand IPI, you need to understand what's going on with containerized import volumes. And for the first half of 18, uh, imports were up nearly 7% in North America. And that's probably where they'll end up the year, something between 6 and 7% growth. Uh, for the year for North America. 
but the first quarter and the second quarter weren't even. In the first quarter, imports grew something in the range of 10%. And in the second quarter, imports only grew about 4%. And I'm not sure I read a whole lot into that. I don't think that sets a bad trend. I think we're looking at still 6 to 7% for the year. I think one way to, to read the numbers is you have to look at comp. Sometimes you hear it's referred to a good comp or bad comp. So comp is simply short for comparison to the prior period or the prior year. So a year ago in the first quarter, growth was pretty weak for the imports. So we have pretty decent growth this year. It looks pretty strong in the first quarter. Conversely, the second quarter last year, there was some pretty good growth. And then to get that same rate of growth, you'd have a huge growth spurt in the second quarter of this year. So it doesn't work that way. It's a little softer growth, but you average the two together, you're getting 7% import growth. That's, that's a very good number. And also, I think one reason for the choppiness in the quarters is that the Chinese New Year, which I'll talk about in a little bit, fell differently. And part of the up and down of the goods movements is related to the Chinese New Year. More of the down fell in the second quarter of this year than last year, and more of the up was in the first quarter. So that creates a bit of choppiness. But it isn't any meaningful difference to suggest there's something fundamentally wrong with the with the imports or the economy. And then I think a, a question that's on everybody's mind is, is tariffs. And one of the things that we've heard anecdotally is that shippers, they brought in a lot of goods early to avoid the tariffs. And I think the second quarter data suggest that that didn't happen. It certainly doesn't prove it conclusively, but if you think that shippers are bringing in a lot of goods early, you'd think there'd be a higher rate of growth in the second quarter than there was. Uh, so we'll have to watch that and, and see. So the next slide talks a little bit more to Tara and in depth, and we showed something similar to this in the, the prior webinar. And the, the yellow red bar represents the elasticity of of the goods, right? So everybody has to put on their thinking cap and remember their um, their old economics. So the elasticity is simply the, the change in quantity demanded as price changes. So that's what the red bar is. TTX looks at containerized imports grouped into, sorry, I don't know my colors. So Pat <laughs> reminded me to uh, read my colors. Uh, yellow is the uh, coefficient. And so you're, you're looking at the change in price, the change in, in quantity, and TTX looks at 15 different commodity groups plus an all other group. So the way to read the chart is if you see a, a high yellow bar, something is, is uh, very sensitive to price change. And if you see a higher red bar, it means there are a lot of imports coming from China. And those two combined could suggest that there might be a problem later on with, with tariffs and hurting the import volumes. Uh, we'll have to see. And, and the reason why it's, it's uncertain is that nobody really knows how the tariff, which essentially acts as a price change, is being metered out into the economy. Do the uh, manufacturers who are selling the goods, do they absorb 100% of the tariff? Do they absorb 15% of the tariff, 50%? Don't really know. The administration here was offered to provide funding or subsidy for farmers when their exports might be tariffed by uh, China. Could foreign governments do the same when tariffs are applied to them? and subsidize uh, the, the cost of the tariff. So we really don't know where it's all going to lead, but potentially it could act as a price increase on billions of dollars worth of goods. I think the, the last discussions, which potentially could, could occur, that the administration was threatening to put 25% tariffs on 500 billion of Chinese goods, which is essentially 100% of all imports from China would have a, a tariff. Now we'll see where that leads, but again, it's hard to make forecasts or projections when you're just not certain what the tariff levels are, are going to be. So clear as mud, I'm sure. And then, so so getting back to that that question of did more goods come in in the, the first and second quarter because shippers wanted to bring something in advance of tariffs? Again, this data would suggest the answer is no. And so the, the simple thing to do would simply be to show a graph of the inventory sales ratio. However, that data simply is not available for another three months, maybe even more than that. So we put together some different data sequences to try and get indication of, of what's going to occur. So the, the blue and the yellow bars are consumption, 
and you can see consumption has been pretty good over the last six months or however period you're looking at, it's been up. But the containerized imports, which is the gray bar, have been below the consumption rate. So if there was going to be a lot of inventory building occurring, you would expect to see the gray bar being much stronger than it's been and certainly above the blue and the yellow bars. And then a few more slides and we're done with the international intermodal section. So we've talked about this before in the webinar. And, and again, we're looking at three things to help us understand the flow of imports and whether they'll move rail inland. So the first are the import volume. And the second is where does it land, which is what this slide speaks to. And we call this all water share. And we've mentioned it before, but all water share is the percent of imports that originate in East Asia. And that would be locations east of Singapore. That's what we define as East Asia. And then that land or discharge in the U.S. East Coast. So that's what this is reflecting. So the black line across the top, it bounces around, but it's essentially about 32, 33%. That's saying that 33% of imports from East Asia discharge on the U.S. East Coast. So the inverse is 67% discharge on the West Coast. And so why is that important for intermodal? That if a container lands on the West Coast, there's roughly a 70 to 75% chance the container will route inland by rail, either IPI or as a transload. But if a container that originates in East Asia lands on the East Coast, there's a fairly small chance it's going to move inland by rail. It's probably going to go by truck to the local market. Maybe 20% likely it'll go rail tops. And over the past few months, say for the first <laughs> half of the year, it's been relatively flat. But you see the spike up a bit only to drop down in April of this year. And Hard to prove, but I think we surmise it really has to do with the, the Chinese New Year. And so I think many in the audience are familiar with the Chinese New Year, that factories in China close for one to two weeks to celebrate the holiday. And so prior to the closing, uh, the factories push out a lot of freight. And then during the closing, there's not a home lot that gets shipped. So you get this up-down pattern of freight shipments, a lot and then a little. And depending on when the lot and the little hit the U.S. or Canada or Mexico is affects the all-water share. And just how the timing of the Chinese, the lunar calendar, uh, meets with the Gregorian calendar and uh, the solar calendar, the down of the Chinese New Year hit the U.S. East Coast in the second quarter of the year, in April, whereas the down of the Chinese New Year hit the U.S. West Coast in the first quarter. So you had the up and down, but then the down of the East Coast in the second quarter. So that makes the all water share spike in the first quarter because there's very little traffic coming to the West Coast. And then all water share drops in the second quarter because very little traffic's coming to the East Coast in April, while a lot of traffic is coming to the U.S. West Coast because the factories at that point have resumed production. and Containers are now hitting the West Coast. I'm getting nods from my coworkers in the room, so hopefully I explain that. It's not a big deal. All I'm saying is all water share despite the spikiness. Oh, that's a good phrase. Despite the spikiness is relatively constant. One more slide to explain, and then we'll get to the, the punchline. Uh, we've talked about this before, too. This is transloading. Again, these are goods that land on a coast in a marine container. That's the ISO box, the 20, the 40, the 45. Contents will get transferred into a 53-foot container or trailer and then route inland by rail from there. And so why would shippers do that? Well, one, there may be some freight savings, freight arbitrage that they can work. You can ship two 53 containers instead of three marine containers. So there could be some savings with that. But generally, I think that the um, customers and shippers like to do this is it helps reduce inventory carrying costs and helps increase sales. And so if you think of an example of maybe some seasonal goods, oftentimes the goods are ordered from the factory eight to 10 weeks, maybe longer from the time they are delivered. And so think of, say, barbecues. This year in the Midwest in Chicago is a pretty crummy spring. So if you're a seller of barbecues and you're bringing barbecues into the imports, you may say, well, spring is really good this year in Nashville or Atlanta or wherever. So if you transload 
in along the west coast or wherever you do it you can then send the goods where they're needed and then wait a couple of months or another month and then send other barbecues to the midwest when maybe spring is improved and you're going to have better sales so it's all about inventory management and i think that really drives a lot of the, the transload and the theme here is that transloading has been fairly stable the, the red bars are the volume and that's growing because imports themselves are growing. The yellow line is the share of imports that transload and move inland by rail. And I stress by rail because there may be more transloading that occurs and there might go truck. So if you're reading or stay local. So if you're reading a report from one of the Western ports, they may have show higher figures for transloading than what we show. And there's nothing going on there other than to say that we look at the smaller subset of the transloads that move inland by rail. And so that share has been fairly constant. It sort of bounces around a little bit, but call it 32, 33, 34% in the PSW, which is the Pacific Southwest, LA Long Beach. But the volumes will continue to grow as long as import volumes themselves are, are growing. And then the last international or multiplied is exactly that. It's the IPI volume. And this is where we started when we were talking about the, the data. So IPI has grown 5.9% uh, so far for the year. May slow a little bit based on some, some harder comps a little later in the year, but I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at growth uh, between four to five, five to six percent in the year, something in that range. And I think it, as the um, title shows in the bottom that rail share gain in the east, as I talked about a, a, a few minutes ago, that the issues that are affecting trucking and competition between rail and truck affect international or modal as well as domestic. And I think this might be a good time then to turn it over to John, who will talk about domestic transportation and those issues that I just mentioned. So thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to start off by referencing some of the common indices that we look at for demand in the greater transportation market. So I'll start off with the cash freight shipment index. A cash, for those of you who don't know, cash is a, a freight bill payment concern. And so they have access to quite a bit of data with regard to freight activity, and they compile it into monthly reports based on freight demand overall, tonnage, as well as they have some rate indexes for both the truckload and the, uh, and the rail environment, inter intermodal environment, I should say, more, more specifically. So this is a freight index that demonstrates freight demand overall in the U.S. market. It's a representation of all freight modes, not just truck. But as, as, as truck represents such a large relative share of the total transportation market, we use it as a, as a proxy for shipment demand in the truck environment. And as you can see, it's been relatively strong this year. For the first seven months of the year, demand has been up about 10.8% on an unweighted basis. And when I say unweighted, unweighted by month. Going to some other indices that we look at, FTR Associates is a uh, transportation Research House in Indiana. They publish this on a regular basis, and this is a truck loadings index. They're a little more subdued in uh, what they're seeing in the market. They're seeing growth in the four to five percent range this year on the truckload specific segment. And it's interesting that if you look at the ATA's own tonnage numbers, ATA is coming in at about five to six percent thus far this year on uh, truck loading, as well as on the uh, LTL side. One other piece of information that we look at on a, on a regular basis, this comes out, I believe, weekly, is a Morgan Stanley's Truckload Freight Index. And this is done based on regular surveys done by Morgan Stanley to the shipping community. And as you can see, there's unprecedented growth in demand in the first half of 2018. That's the uh, red line that you can see. And what this actually represents is changes in demand versus changes in supply. So the higher the number that you'll see on the uh, on the right hand, uh, the x-axis, the excuse me, the y-axis, the higher the demand versus supply, and this changes on a week-to-week -week basis. After settling down in the first couple of months of the year, which was largely weather-related and also implementation of the electronic logging devices. It settled down quite nicely and became a little more balanced. And then you see an uptick in June, and now it's come June into July, and now it's come down. And generally, the, the feedback that we're getting from intermodal marketing companies, as well as uh, uh, truckload carriers and the railroads, 
is saying business is very strong, but the demand versus supply is becoming a little more balanced now. So it's not so much a sold out environment, but it is still relatively strong. I wanted to take a little more look at what the capacity is on the trucking side. So we're, we're seeing, say, five, call it five to seven, eight percent growth on, uh, for truckload demand. And that, of course, translates into intermodal demand. We're also seeing unprecedented growth in the number of truckload orders. And I think this is, has a lot of people's attention. And I wanted to really paint a little more balanced picture on this. Uh, the question is, how much of the of the purported demand growth is actually capacity related growth and how much of it is due to other factors so there's quite a few factors playing into this one is that we are entering in the trucking market we're entering into a replacement cycle a lot of carriers replace their trucks every three to four years and as you can see in the slides back in 2016 back uh, 2015 2016 there were very few orders and so we're entering into a replacement cycle to to change out those those tractors that were ordered in 2014 and 2015. Uh, in addition, technology has improved and trucks have become much more fuel efficient just in the last couple of years. Given that we have a stronger fuel pricing environment now, this is becoming more of an issue and it, it helps the trucking OEMs sell their equipment that much more easily just because of the improved fuel economy that the new trucks get. Another reason is just the overall health of the trucking environment. The trucking industry as a whole is very profitable right now. In fact, margins for the first half of the year are up nearly 300 basis points over 2017. So the carriers are making a lot of money. They need to spend that money, avoid taxes. The, the new tax laws have helped on the depreciation side. So it's a very attractive environment for the truckers to go out and invest in new equipment. A couple other points about this. Truckers are, of course, having a, a big issue in recruiting drivers, and one of the main selling points that they do have is offering newer or new equipment to prospective drivers. And this is what we've been told, this is actually driving some of the sales. The fact that a driver can actually come in and get a new model, latest model with all the bells and whistles, is a, a major selling point, and it's a lifestyle consideration, if you will. For the drivers as they try to select among the carriers that are trying to recruit them. And finally, just one point with regard to the orders and how much they're growing. You should also look at this in the context of the, the supply side. The trucking and OEMs, the, the uh, International Harvesters, the Volvos of the world are having a very difficult time on the supply side in sourcing componentry, uh, particularly if they're imported. And they're having a lot of trucks that are that are being delayed for delivery because of lack of parts. And so that is extending out the delivery cycle. It's making a lot of trucking companies nervous, um, considering that this is a fairly strong market right now. And truckers are actually placing orders just to get in line. Order cancellation rates are actually going up. You'll see that they've been ticking up by about two percentage points each each month for the last several months. So a lot of the orders are, are really just placeholders. Uh, from what we've been told, there's not a lot of financial ramification to a carrier or to a dealer canceling an order after it's been placed. And so this is a, an effective tool that they use in order to obtain supply in, in the future. Uh, at, at this point, 2018 is sold out. Orders for delivery are going into the first quarter and possibly even the second quarter of 2019. One thing I, I did want to comment, too, on what we're seeing with regard to Class A truck orders and how this is improving capacity in the industry, our best estimate is that this is going to, the, the capacity-related growth in the orders this year are going to increase the truckers' capacity by about 1.7%, 1.5%, which is pretty closely in line with the trucking recruiting efforts that we've seen thus far in 2018. We've calculated that the driver capacity growth has approached about 1.4% growth for the first six months of this year. On the intermodal side, with regard to capacity in the equipment side, the container growth for this year, we're expecting to be about 7.4%. As many of you may know, there was a, uh, a possibility that containers would be subject to import tariffs. And that was causing a lot of uh, concern within the container owner community. 
This was discussed in Washington and uh, after hearings that were supported by a lot of the box owners, the potential for the tariff was pulled from the docket. And so there's an exemption out there for domestic containers. So the container owners are breathing a sigh of relief as they've been able to uh, dodge a bullet for now. Unfortunately for the industry, it looks like chassis are the next target. In fact, this week, hearings have started on the possible implementation of 25% tariffs on Chinese-built chassis. The vast majority of domestic chassis used in the U.S. are built in China. Some of them are, or many of them are actually assembled in the U.S., but they are built in China, so they would be subject to the tariff. This could raise chassis prices by as much as $3,500 per unit or more. And there are chassis manufacturers in the U.S. However, it's our understanding that the production capability of these chassis makers is somewhat limited. So it's not clear as to how the market dynamics would shift should these be tariffs be put into place. On a per cost basis, the increase in the chassis cost may be considered relatively small over the assets depreciated life, but it would certainly be added to what we already have as inflationary conditions in the freight market. The last bullet, what I've talked about is a wait and see attitude. So there's much concern, I think, not just in the transportation community, but in the industry as a whole about the implications of these tariffs and should they be put in place, how long are they going to last? This may cause a wait and see attitude among potential purchasers saying, I'm going to delay my purchase because the, once the smoke clears, the tariff may be very short lived and I'll be able to buy after the tariff is disposed of. So we're not sure what this is going to do to the ordering cycle. It's interesting to note that the utility of chassis and containers, excuse me, chassis, yeah, chassis and containers is being hampered a little in part by the driver shortage. A lot of anecdotal evidence out there that is telling us that the loss of productivity that the industry is faced with, with drivers having to be restricted on, on hours of service, this is forcing carriers to play a much harder line with shippers in throughputting the drivers through origin and destination facilities. So there's been a lot of pressure with carriers on shippers to either pay up if you're going to be holding drivers or more preferably cycling the drivers through facilities faster. And that has caused shippers to push back and request more drop and hook situations. Good for the drivers, gets the drivers out quickly of these facilities. Unfortunately, it has a downward utilization rate on containers as instead of turning a container and a chassis out of a facility in two to three hours, the container may sit there for two to three days waiting for the next pickup. So that's something that we'll be looking at to see what the productivity will be in this new environment on uh, intermodal equipment. So overall, we're seeing very solid domestic container volumes, domestic containers being the 48 foot to a very less extent, but uh, primarily the 53 foot containers. Uh, what we're expecting to, volumes to be on uh, five to six percent higher on an annual basis. So we're keeping pace with trucking. And actually, when you consider the trailer market, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, the domestic intermodal segment may be picking up a little bit of market share from the truckload industry overall. Trailer growth. So this is a surprise, I think, to all of us. Trailers have been long stagnant since dropping about 25 percent during the Great Recession. They came back with a vengeance last year, starting in the third quarter, and trailers have been very strong in, in all segments, notably the temperature control segment, as well as the LTL and parcel segment. For the first half, we saw a growth of about 16%. We're expecting that the market will end up at about 13% growth for the remainder of the year. The reason why it's going down from the first half results is just that we'll be facing tougher comparisons for the second half of this year. Okay. A few more slides to go and we can wrap up, but last time we had a, a section on what we're watching, so we had something similar today. And this slide Pat already talked about, but just sort of the theme would be we're watching for signs of recession. And it's a good economy now, and we'll see what happens down the road, so to speak. And then the, the next slide we're watching, again, is, is tariffs. John talked about the, the tariffs affecting containers, but then the tariffs were removed. So again, hard to figure out what the tariffs cover, what they don't. Will the tariffs be applied to chassis? And then overall, what do the tariffs uh, mean? I think this is the last, we showed this exact slide at the last webinar 
Uh, the only addition was in the in the bottom left. Uh, we had a little section that I think originally when the tariffs were going to be applied, there was a discussion. Uh, it was going to be 25% on 50 billion worth of Chinese goods, and then it moved to 10% on 250 billion dollars worth of goods, and then it went to 25% to hasn't been applied yet, but it could be 25% on 250 billion, and then it's threatened. 25% on 500 billion. So again, a, a moving target, but we're watching all of this to see what the impact uh, could be on import volume and then on uh, an intermold. And then the last uh, slide that we have is impact of, of Marple, and John and I will, will talk about this one jointly. So Marple, it's a United Nations agency, but they regulate international shipping, and most countries agree to follow the rules of Marple. And several years ago, there was a rule that required the ocean carriers to burn high-grade uh, diesel fuel or low-sulfur fuel uh, within 200 miles of the coast. I think they would call those uh, containment areas. And it was the European coast and the North American coast. And so I think what a lot of carriers did is they just added a, a separate fuel tank and they would burn marine-grade uh, diesel or MDO, marine diesel oil to solve this problem, a few carriers who are burning LNG. Looking ahead in 2020, the rules will change and the carriers will be required to burn the higher quality fuel everywhere they sail. And fuel costs are roughly 50% of a vessel's operating costs. So about a doubling of the fuel cost would represent about a 25% increase in steamship operating costs. And so how is that going to, again, this is in 2020, how will that affect the dynamic of steamship operations? How does that affect pricing? How will that affect cost? Does that push more freight, all, all water freight, does that push that freight back to the West Coast? Because steamship lines will burn a lot less fuel sailing to the West Coast instead of through either the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal. Yes, John. Yeah, so the primary requir requirement for the steamship companies would be to burn MDO, but they do have some alternatives. And the alternatives being actually equipping their ships with scrubbers. The scrubbers would take out the sulfur, the sulfur compounds within the fuel's exhaust. That is actually being done with a fair amount of vessels. The issue that they have on this is it's, it's many fold. One is that the scrubbers will only be useful for four years until 2024, I believe where new emission standards get placed in on NOx emissions. And so the scrubbers will not serve to alleviate the nitrous compounds that will be required to be removed by the, the uh, upcoming rules. Also, there are only so many scrubber manufacturers and so many scrubber installers, if you will, in the globe. And from what we've read and understood that if you've not gotten in line to get a scrubber equipped on your ship right now, you will not get them equipped in 2020. That was something that the more cautious uh, steamship companies looked at earlier and, and have applied those. Another option is the burning of LNG. And for those of you who subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, there was actually an article today in the journal about the, the use of LNG by more and more cruise carriers. And they did mention that only about 5% of the large commercial vessels are or will be burning LNG. It's a, it's a very complex fuel to burn from a storage transfer infrastructure as well as a operation standpoint. It works for some carriers, but it won't work for everyone. And so many of the carriers in our estimation will be stuck with the, the marine diesel oil option, which will be extremely expensive. Right, I think scrubbers might cost five to six million to install, maybe a little bit more. And if the cost to burn, uh, or a typical voyage might burn $3 million in fuel, if those costs double to $6 million, you can see that a scrubber could pay for itself pretty quickly. On the other hand, if the rules change in two or four years, whenever the NOx emissions go into effect, you don't get much value from time to get value from the, the installing the scrubber. And one piece of the, the scrubber cost component is you need to take the ship out of service to install the scrubber. And if you apply those costs to the cost of installing the scrubber, it's actually fairly expensive. 
So all of these options, no matter what you look at, are probably going to be raising steamship operating costs quite a bit. And then the last bullet I'll let John talk about too, but the marine diesel oil, somebody has to refine that oil, that the ocean carriers will consume a lot of diesel fuel. And the question is, how much capacity is there to produce the diesel fuel? You simply, if you're burning bunker fuel today, those facilities that make bunker can't convert quickly or easily or may not at all to refine diesel fuel. So you need a lot of refined capacity. And does that mean that domestic fuel prices uh, will increase? Yeah, so we're expecting, we, we haven't quantified the, the impact yet, but we're expecting that marine diesel oil, which is not interchangeable, but a very similar spec to over the road diesel fuel, the, the increased consumption of that in North America will obviously have a, a positive impact on fuel prices, positive meaning that they'll go up. So with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. That's terrific. Thank you, guys. Fantastic, as always. Uh, we have a number of questions here from the attendees. The first one goes back to what you talked about, Peter, around transloading. In the 2006-2007 time frame, there was a fairly significant dip in transloading. Any idea what that correlates with or may have caused that? So what happened back in 2006? Well, you know, I can't remember my kids' names. Now I have to remember 12 years ago. That may have been a large retailer shifting some operation and changing from transloading cargo to Chicago to having it move uh, IPI instead. And they were large enough that that caused a bit of a dip, but it bounced back up fairly quickly. Great. Here's one. Do international volumes reflect the expansion of the Panama Canal and sort of a follow-on, the raising of the Bayonne Bridge? So I would answer that no, but that's not really getting to the question. I mean, the volumes itself are not really driven by the Panama Canal or the raising of the Bayonne Bridge in the sense that if you're bringing in, say, consumer goods or goods that are auto parts that are going to go into a, a factory in the U.S. or in Canada to make an automobile, the overall cost calculation of the shipping doesn't change enough that your consumer purchases are, are going to change, right? So the clothes that you wear, you're not buying another pair of shoes because the Bayonne Bridge is 20 feet, feet higher. It doesn't really work that way. So it's not a the volumes aren't changing in, in that sense. But I don't think that's really the question. The question is, was that affect where goods come in? And uh, are we going to see more all water? All water has been growing steadily since 2002 when there was a labor strike, a labor disruption on the West Coast. And the owners of the goods, the, the retailers, the BCOs, they wanted to, at that point, change their strategy to avoid outages and disruptions. So they went to a four-corner strategy. So instead of bringing in all their goods into one port, say the Pacific Southwest, they're going to bring their goods into the PNW, Pacific Southwest, Southeast, uh, New York, the Mid-Atlantic. So four corners. And that strategy is continuing and is continuing to continue. So when we looked at all water, it's up a little bit. If you go back to an all water slide, you can see that all water share really didn't change a whole lot when the Panama Canal uh, completed its expansion in 2016. 2017, I think all water share might have even dipped just a little bit. And, and all water share didn't change significantly during the recession, where there was just a huge amount of capacity through the canal. Mm -hmm. Right. So you you open up capacity because there was a great reduction in imports, but uh, that did not have more move through the Panama Canal. And the other thing we'll always say about our industry, too, uh, is uh, remember um, there are many competitors to the Panama Canal, including among our owners, CPCN, BNSF, and Union Pacific. Um, are they simply going to go say, no, go ahead, take it all, or will they compete? So I, I think, you know, the, the, the shippers like diversification, but I think the economics many times still favor West Coast discharge for the, yeah. for the good. But as a hedge, you see freight moving to the, the East Coast. And keep in mind, too, that there's a lot of freight that lands on the East Coast that originates in South America, in Europe, and raising the Brown Bridge helps that freight. But that's not all water freight. That's not a ship off the West Coast. Here's a good one. 
taking a look at the traffic through Chicago, I know that there had been some congestion issues there earlier. Any thoughts on how Chicago is going to fare throughout the rest of this year and in the next year with regard to congestion? That ends up in the question is, uh, can you give me the weather forecast for the next winter? That's really hard to de- determine. Fair enough. We've got an interesting one here, slightly more international flavor. In 2017, lane growth in Canada reflected earlier wildfires. Do we know anything about the drivers behind this year's uh, top lane growth? I would say the, the top lane growth is, is a function of volume coming in. The Northeast Midwest growing at 18% uh, and a fairly decent uh, share is, uh, I think, a function of what John was talking about that uh, driver shortage, ELDs, uh, growth in freight from Europe coming to uh, the East Coast and then moving by rail inland. This traffic might have moved a truck previously. Um, And then domestic volumes in in the East are are growing fairly strong as well. Here's one that kind of riffs on that a little bit. This time last year, transloading in the PNW was growing in both volumes and shares. Do you have a sense for what it will look like this year? I think it'll it'll certainly grow in share. Part of that is just the, the first four months of the year, imports into the P&W decline. So it's just kind of a, a math equation where the denominator is shrinking. Even if the, the numerator is flat, it, it changes the, the share. But I think we've seen transload grow as well. It may be up uh, three or four, uh, not share points, but percent growth year over year. I think the data shows that the last two to three months into the P&W, imports have grown at a fairly rapid clip. And I think that uh, IPI volumes have grown in the last couple of months as well. I think for the year, I think peers would report that imports in the P&W are down two-tenths of a percent. But that same data is showing about a 25% increase in volume in, in June. So hopefully the, the P&W might have turned a corner and you're going to start to see some pretty decent growth up there. Well... That's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank our guests from TTX again for joining us to examine the results from the first half of 2018, share their insights, and help explain what the numbers really mean. For more information on Intermodal Market Trends and Statistics Report and the Equipment Type, Size, and Ownership Database, or ETSO database, please visit intermodal.org or email us at info at intermodal.org. Thanks for joining us at IANA the connecting force behind freight.